Hello and welcome to our virtual symposium, Solutions for Tenosynovial Giant Cell Tumours. During this event, we'll use a mini lecture and case discussion format to explore collaborative strategies for capturing different tenosynovial giant cell tumour presentations and developing effective treatment plans. My name is Robin Jones and I'm an oncologist from the Royal Marsden Hospital and ICR in London. And I'm delighted to welcome um, two excellent colleagues, Dr. Emanuela Palmarini from um, the um, Rizzoli Institute in Bologna, Italy, and Dr. Kristen Ganju from Stanford University Medical Center in California. Before we move on, I would like to thank the Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PBI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education, for developing this educational event and also to Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated for providing the educational grant for this webcast. So these are my um, disclosures on this slide. And here are Dr. Ganju's disclosures. And on the third slide, Dr. Palmarini's disclosures. The planners from Medical Learning Institutes are the accredited provider and PVI Peerview Institute for Medical Education, the joint provider, do not have any financial relationships with an ACCME defined commercial interest related to the content of this accredited activity during the past 12 months unless listed below. The following content peer reviewers have nothing to disclose. Stacey L. Sims, Natalie I. Vokes. And this slide um, uh, lists the disclosures of unlabeled use, as well as a disclaimer. So please visit us at peerview.com TGCT20, where you can apply for credit and download the slides and practice aids. There will also be an on-demand version of this event available in the coming weeks. So in terms of today's agenda, um, as I mentioned, there'll be a number of mini lectures on TGCT presentations, diagnostic standards, recurrence risk, and the shape of current treatment. We'll also have case discussions, which will highlight the collaborative strategies for managing a diverse suite of TGCT presentations. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Ganju for the first mini lecture. <clears throat> Thanks, Robin. Um, basically, what I'm going to do is just go over some classification and uh, different subtypes of TGCT and diagnostic standards, including MRI imaging and a team-based approach for uh, taking care of these patients. So the, in terms of WHO classification, TGCT or tenosynovial giant cell tumors, they're locally aggressive inflammatory neoplasm. They're not malignant, but they basically uh, occur in the synovium of the joints, bursa and the tendon sheets. And you can see on the left image, this is the gross uh, picture of a uh, TGCT tumor. In the middle panel, you can see an MRI image of uh, the tumor in the back of the knee. And on the right side panel, you can see the difference on physical exam on the right knee versus the left knee in terms of patients presenting with swelling and um, uh, disfiguration of the knee on exam. There are um, several, this is where it gets confusing for some uh, physicians taking care of these patients is that there are several names for this disease. So initially, we used to call this PVNS, which was basically, um, uh, you know, pigmented villanodular synovitis. There is another name that goes with giant cell tumor of the tendon sheet, and then also tenosynovial giant cell tumor, which we will stick to during this presentation. There are, sub, there are two different kinds of um, TGCT. There is a localized type and there's a diffuse type. If you look at the top picture, the localized type is just one uh, nodule. These are usually 
approximately around two centimeters as a single nodule. They're well circumscribed. And in terms of um, incidence, it's 10.2 per, per million person years. If you look at the bottom panel, the diffuse type, these are larger tumors, uh, usually more than five centimeters, and they're multi-nodular. They can be in the anterior compartment or the posterior or both. And they're typically very destructive and aggressive locally, and you can see a lot of joint destruction in some of these patients. This is a little bit more uh, less uh, rare than the other subtype, which was the localized type. So it's about 4.1 per million person years. When we look at the uh, histologic uh, subtypes, there are four subtypes. Uh, one on the bot on the top hand side on the left, the, you can see these giant si cell subtypes, and you can see a big giant cell in the middle of the um, picture. And the bottom uh, left hand side is a siderophage uh, subtype. The, then the the top right hand side, you can see the foam macrophages and the bottom mononuclear type. So there, these are the four cellular subtypes of TGCT. The interesting thing about this uh, tumor is there's a translocation between chromosome one and two. And this causes the protein, uh, the CSF1 um, and COL6A3 genes to combine uh, together and uh, cause overexpression of colony stimulating factor one. The pathogenesis of TGCT is basically based on this translocation, which causes the CSF1 overexpression in subpopulation of neoplastic cells. And this results in recruitment of CSF1 receptor bearing inflammatory cells. And that's why they, it leads to tumor formation, it leads to inflammation, and also damage to the joints. In this, um, study, there were 34 TGCT samples that um, 18 of them had RNA sequencing and 34 samples had whole genome sequencing. And on the left-hand side, you can see the novel fusions. Um, there were some, uh, there's CSF1 in all of these, and then you can see the partner gene on the right-hand side of the CSF1. And uh, the CBL missense mutation was present in 35% of patients. And this actually uh, tells us, in, in this study, it showed that um, they had these type of uh, TGCT patients who had this missense mutation had a higher relapse potential. So we are kind of getting a little bit closer in terms of subclassifying higher risk patients versus uh, lower risk patients as far as relapse is concerned. The problem with this disease uh, mainly is that it occurs in younger patients, patients that are less than 40 years of age. Uh, even though it's a benign tumor, it's extremely aggressive locally and it causes dest destruction of the joint. As far as distribution between males and females, it's equal distribution. As I mentioned earlier, the incidence is 11 to 20 per million persons year. It's a very rare disease. Metastasis is extremely rare, uh, but it has been seen. And as far as uh, recurrence rate, patients who have localized disease um, mostly have less than 15% uh, recurrence rate. Uh, but diffuse subtype, half of the patients usually do have recurrences. And it becomes very difficult because it can be in the anterior and posterior compartment, which requires two different surgical um, procedures, but uh, it can be pretty diffuse, destroying the entire uh, joint. In terms of uh, diagnostic standards, uh, we have the initial uh, thing that um, uh, modality that we always use is x-ray. And you can see here on this, on the left-hand side, a plain x-ray showing some destruction in the joint. Uh, in the middle panel is a CT scan, and we normally do CT scans if patients are not able to get MRIs. And you can also see here that there is some tumor involvement and there is some destruction of the bone. On the right-hand panel, MRIs, and I'll go into that a little bit detail, in detail. And this uh, MRI is the main modality for um, 
looking at extent of disease. Um, when you look at this, uh, try to evaluate this MRI, it's a standard MRI we, you know, we usually do with and without IV contrast, but I will go through the contrast portion, which is basically not needed. But when you look at the MRI, the synovial villi are populated, um, and you can also see these uh, hemocytorin-laden macrophages. And on the GRE images, it's useful um, since it kind of um, adds a little bit of more detail to GRE images. And, but contrast is not needed really for um, evaluating P uh, TGCT on um, MRI. And if you look at this, uh, on the left-hand side of this slide, it's the uh, fat suppression images. And you can see this white uh, mass and the behind the knee. And on the right hand panel, you can see the T1 images and you can see this gray um, mass behind the knee. So it's uh, T1 images and fat suppression is usually what's needed. And there is also um, the gradient echo that we talked about, the GE images. It kind of helps in terms of um, uh, you know, looking at the tumor images and larges when you look at the gradient echo images. So um, I'm going to pass uh, the presentation to Dr. Palmarini, uh, who will discuss the severity and recurrence risk. I am uh, Dr. Emanuela Palmerini. I work in Italy at the uh, uh, Research Institute uh, uh, Rizzoli in Bologna, and um, uh, I will uh, talk a little more on the use of, of uh, MRI in this disease. Uh, our, our colleagues uh, in um, Leiden uh, performed this uh, interesting uh, study. They looked at MRI of uh, 283 consecutive cases. They wanted to have an homogeneous series, so they excluded uh, 60 cases not therapy naive, and uh, also cases not treated with up and synoviectomy, and uh, also no pretreatment was allowed. So they classified their risk of recurrent based on MRI findings. As you can see, there are four layers of uh, uh, assessment. So uh, first, uh, the localized or diffuse form. Second, the articular involvement, and third, the involvement of both ligaments and tendinose muscular tissues. And based on those uh, uh, questions, they uh, were able to classify diseases in four classes. So localized mild, where there's no involvement of, of muscles, muscles. Uh, localized severe with a relapse rate of 88 uh, when uh, muscles and ligaments are involved. And then these, these fused disease can uh, be, can have uh, intra or extra articular involvement and there's mild diffuse, 59% uh, re recurrence free survival. And the worst case scenario is when there are both intra and extra articular uh, MRI involvement, which is a severe diffuse class with a relapse free survi um, survival at four years of uh, only 36%. And this is the first uh, uh, retrospective series on, uh, with the aim of uh, analyzing the relapse uh, risk of uh, these uh, tumors. 294 cases uh, from uh, three institutions, uh, Memorial Zone Caring, Estudio uh, Nazionale Tumori in Milan, and uh, Rizzoli in Bologna were um, uh, put together. The median age of the patient was 36. And uh, as you can see, uh, most uh, affected joint was the knee, 60% of the patient, followed uh, uh, by the ankle and the hip, uh, as uh, we know. And as uh, we just saw on um, CT scan, bone involvement might be uh, present in, and it was uh, 18%. Importantly, uh, only patient with a new diagnosis or first local relapse were included to address the relapse risk of uh, this uh, class of patients. 
and both localized and uh, diffuse uh, patients were included. Uh, the majority have diffuse uh, disease, 69%. None of these uh, uh, patients developed metastasis. Local recurrence was overall 28%, 14% in localized patient, 36 in patient with diffuse disease. The median time of relapse varies a lot, but uh, the, uh, it's about 16 months, so one year uh, something. The five-year local relapse-free survival in this series was 66%. And we observed that 40% keep relapsing up to five times. Uh, the univariate analysis for uh, relapse-free survival at five years showed a significant difference based on size. Uh, with 62% uh, as compared to 80% with patients above 5 cm and below 2 cm. And also histology, of course, uh, um, was important. Diffuse at a five-year local relapse-free rate of 62 as compared to 78. Also, we looked at the um, type of surgery and the reason for admission, as you can see, Patient that relapse at a very high risk of a, a subsequent relapse. And uh, also type of surgery was um, important, uh, like with a relapse-free rate uh, better for patient with complete uh, macroscopic uh, resection. Uh, this uh, is the curve underscoring the important significant difference in between presenting for the first uh, time or uh, presenting with a relapse uh, at the center. In uh, la last year, with um, um, uh, the global effort of um, several centers uh, in the US and uh, Europe, we performed this. Uh, a global multicentric retrospective study on more than 1,000 patients, 966 uh, cases were uh, uh, included uh, to address uh, the risk uh, rate. And um, we all analyzed the type of treatment, as you can see, and the most uh, of the patient underwent, uh, under, uh, undergo a one stage uh, open surgery. And um, we have to acknowledge that uh, arthroscopy synoviectomy is it's used in about 15% of the cases and less than 1% as, as an amputation. As we say, the bone may be very affected by the disease and the 6% of the cases, a prosthetic replacement was uh, required. A recurrence rate was 44%, very similar to the, to the prior series, and the local relapse-free survival at five years was 55%. Again, <laughs> the patient with new diagnosis did better, and uh, these are on the left, the cur curve showing the worse survival for patients with rec recurrent disease. Also, we look at the um, uh, surgical technique and uh, no difference for uh, open versus arthroscopic uh, uh, technique was uh, observed when we look at uh, new cases uh, on uh, the knee, while uh, other sites like uh, ankle um, or hip uh, might be better treated with uh, um, open surgery, even though it's a retrospective finding. So all uh, the, um, this um, retrospective evidence uh, underscore the um, high risk of uh, relapse and uh, uh, repetitive um, uh, relapse of uh, this patient. So I, we um, believe, um, need to discuss uh, with uh, our surgeon alternative um, uh, approach or maybe combined approach 
based on uh, multidisciplinary discussion. Great, thank you, um, Emanuela and um, Kristen. So my uh, mini lecture is on um, a look at modern uh, treatment options in uh, TGCT, um, specifically looking at uh, systemic therapies. And this slide um, ties in quite nicely with the previous two uh, lectures in terms of the management of um, TGCT. And in terms of the management of a patient with a new diagnosis, um, as has been mentioned for um, local disease, open or atheroscopic uh, procedures can be um, uh, considered and um, uh, varying uh, recurrence rates published in uh, the literature. And then for um, diffuse um, disease, um, open or uh, complete resection could be um, considered, but with a relatively high uh, recurrence rate. And then for unresectable disease, um, there is now the option of um, uh, systemic therapy, and that's um, going to be the main focus of this component of the uh, presentation. So as the um, previous two um, presentations have highlighted, uh, we really do need to have a multidisciplinary view of um, treatment for this um, challenging um, disease. And um, the approach can consist of surgery, but also other um, modalities. And along with surgery, physical therapy is important as part of uh, post-surgical um, planning to rehabilitate uh, joint function. In certain instances, radiation uh, can be um, considered. And of course, symptomatic or palliative treatments can also be used. So anti-inflammatory drugs or steroids as uh, pain uh, relievers. But there are also uh, targeted therapies um, available for this condition now. As I mentioned, radiation may be an option for specific patients with TGCT, um, uh, but it isn't considered a standard treatment should really be reserved for inoperable disease or as an adjuvant treatment for residual disease following surgery, uh, particularly with extra articular involvement or persistent recurrences. And of course, uh, this modality is associated with uh, potential complications, which can include skin reactions, poor wound healing, as well as joint stiffness. But there are um, other uh, serious long-term complications, including pathological fractures, as well as uh, secondary um, cancers, radiation-associated cancers. Another approach that can be considered is radiosinovectomy, uh, which involves the installation of a colloid containing radioisotope into the joint. This has been used, although it does carry the risk of uh, radionecrosis um, and is not indicated for um, extra articular disease. So pexidartinib is a potent and specific inhibitor of CSF1R kinase activity, and this provides the biological rationale um, for the use of um, CSF1R inhibitors in TGCT, as outlined by Dr. Gandrew's uh, presentation. So the um, initial evidence for the activity of pexidartinib in uh, TGCT was provided from an expansion cohort of a uh, phase one trial of this agent, uh, which included uh, 23 patients, and 20 of these patients had um, uh, response rates that were um, accessible. And the activity of the drug can be shown on the um, chart on the uh, right-hand side of this slide, um, showing the uh, responses, the confirmed uh, resist partial responses to treatment and the number of patients continuing on treatment. So these promising data led to uh, the Enliven randomized phase three trial of pexidartinib for advanced TGCT. And this slide outlines the um, design of the trial. So um, the trial was open to patients with histologically confirmed advanced symptomatic TGCT in these patients, surgical resection was associated with potential for worsening of a functional limitation or severe morbidity. And in addition, patients had to have disease that was measurable and greater than or equal to two centimeters by resist 1.1. Patients were stratified according to um, US versus non-US sites, as well as upper versus lower extremity um, tumors. And as you can see, uh, patients were randomized one-to-one -one 
um, to either receive pexidartinib or matching placebo. So part one of the trial, at the first 24 weeks, um, patients um, were um, uh, allocated to uh, one of the randomization arms and were masked. And pexidartinib was administered at a dose of 1,000 milligram daily, um, split twice a day for two weeks, followed by 800 milligram daily, split twice a day for 22 weeks. And then at 24 weeks, um, uh, the trial went into the second part of the open label extension um, with uh, pexidartinib continued at the uh, current dose. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see that um, uh, patient reported outcomes were um, assessed, MRI were, um, response evaluation was assessed, as well as a range of motion. This shows the activity of uh, pexidartinib compared to placebo within the enlivened trial. So the um, top um, uh, part on the left shows the change uh, from uh, baseline in tumor diameter. Um, so you can see that there was an impressive uh, response rate in the pexidartinib arm consisting of 61 patients compared to the um, uh, placebo arm. And similarly, um, in terms of the um, change from baseline in the tumor volume score, which is a specific radiological assessment developed for um, use in TGCT. And you can also see on the uh, right-hand side of the um, slide that uh, patients on placebo crossing over to pexidartinib also derived benefit in the second part of the trial from treatment with uh, the um, active drug. So in terms of the primary um, endpoints of the trial, uh, the primary endpoint was met. So the overall response rate for the uh, pexidartinib arm was 39%. So uh, 24 out of 61 patients had a uh, response, uh, whereas it, n none of the patients in the um, placebo arm had a response. And this was a, a statistically st significant um, finding. Indeed, um, nine um, patients in the pexidartinib arm of 15% had a um, radiological complete response to, to treatment. And this was also reflected in the uh, response rate based on the um, tumor uh, volume score or TVS uh, for the first part of the trial. And again, there was a significant difference between the pexidartinib arm and placebo. So the TVS uh, response rate um, uh, for the pexidartinib arm was 56% compared to 0% for the placebo arm. Again, a highly significant difference. And based on these data, uh, pexidartinib was approved by the FDA uh, in the United States for use in symptomatic TGCT associated with severe morbidity or functional limitations and not amenable to improvement with surgery. So the next slide um, clearly um, illustrates the, um, the um, efficacy of pexidartinib in um, uh, TGCT. And you can see that um, this patient had a very severe um, case of the um, disease. And it's easy to visualize the, um, the benefit and the response of treatment from um, initiation of trial-based treatment um, to uh, all the way through uh, to May 2018. So in terms of um, adverse events of interest, um, uh, 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 liver function derangements are important to highlight. And this slide um, uh, shows some of these um, adverse events of interest. So um, for, um, in terms of hair color changes, um, there was uh, the, of any grade hair color change, 67% um, in the pexidartinib arm uh, compared to 3% in the um, placebo arm. And um, fatigue of any grade was 54% in the pexidartinib arm compared to 36% in the placebo arm. And moving on to um, liver function test um, derangements. So in the uh, pexidartinib arm, uh, in terms of grade three or four um, AST increase, this occurred in six patients or 10%. ALT increase again occurred in six patients or 10%. ALP increases in four patients or 7%. Um, uh, and none in the, um, in the placebo arm. Um, none of the um, patients had grade three or four uh, liver function derangements. 
And similarly uh, for patients in the uh, crossover at week 24, uh, crossing over from placebo to uh, pexidartinib, um, uh, um, developed um, grade three or four um, liver function changes. So um, only 3% for um, AST and um, ALP and 7% for um, ALT. And uh, the next slide uh, shows the um, elevated liver enzymes and total bilirubin for part one and part two of the uh, trial. So for the entire uh, safety um, population, and again, you can see that uh, for um, an AST or an ALT increase of uh, greater than three times the upper limit of normal occurred in 20 or 33 percent of the patients in the pexidartinib arm. An ALP increase of greater than 2.5 times the upper limit of normal occurred in five patients or 8 percent in the pexidartinib arm. And a total bilirubin increase of greater than twice the upper limit of normal occurred in three or or 5% of the pexidartinib arm. And um, then a total bilirubin increase of greater than twice the upper limit of normal and an AST or ALT increase of three times the upper limit of normal occurred in three patients or 5% of the pexidartinib arm. And then moving on to the part two component of the trial for patients crossing over from placebo to pexidartinib, four of these or 13% developed an AST or an ALT increase of greater than three times the upper limit of normal. So um, targeted therapies are now included in the guidelines for um, TGCT and the most recent NCCN um, um, guidelines from 2020 have included uh, both pexidartinib and um, imatinib as systemic therapy options for this disease. So in terms of a synthesis of all of these um, pres presentations, um, the first point to note is that TGCT is a benign, though often highly morbid, inflammatory neoplasm arising in joints and driven primarily by a small proportion of cells ha harboring the COL6A3 CSF1 translocation, leading to excessive CSF1 expression. The second point regards surgery, and this is the current standard of care, but surgery as a standalone therapy is problematic and severe morbidity when present may limit the beneficial impact of surgery. And the third point to note is that there is now an approved systemic therapy for this disease based on the phase three trial, and pexidartinib is approved for TGCT associated with severe morbidity or functional limitations when surgery is unlikely to benefit the patient. So we'll move on to um, some questions. And um, the first question is, what is the appropriate timing for considering systemic therapy for TGCT, e.g. at first versus second versus third recurrence post-surgery? So I may ask um, uh, Kristen uh, for her thoughts, um, uh, followed by Emanuela on this first question. So it's uh, basically, individualized and for every patient. It depends on extent of disease. It depends on how morbid the surgery is going to be. It depends on whether or not the entire tumor mass, uh, multiple nodules can be removed. So it's uh, based on multiple different factors. And I think the best option you know, is to have a tumor board discussion uh, where the surgeons, radiologists, and uh, the medical oncologists are present and every patient's case is pres presented and it's um, different um, in each patient. So if a patient presents and um, has had surgeries in the past uh, and has a lot of symptoms related to the TGCT, but the surgery is going to be morbid, the surgery is not going to be completely, um, you know, uh, taking care of the entire disease. And if the relapse rate is very high, then that's the time when I start systemic therapy with pexidartinib. Uh, yes, I totally agree on uh, multi need of multidisciplinary discussion in these uh, patient, patients. And also it's very important uh, to, to keep in mind the patient's uh, preferences. 
Uh, we all know that uh, uh, treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors uh, are meant to be long term. And um, once we stop the treatment, uh, the tumor uh, go back uh, rising. So uh, all patient preferences, including family planning, have to be taken into account, especially in this age uh, uh, group, uh, which uh, uh, runs uh, for 30 to 44 uh, of age, roughly. Great. So uh, very good answers to that question. And this, uh, the second uh, question is, during the COVID-19 pandemic, have you been learning more, leaning more towards outpatient treatment with agents like pexidartinib rather than additional surgery to avoid uh, clinic visits? So maybe I'll um, ask uh, Kristen to, to start and um, Manuela to, um, uh, to then uh, give her thoughts on, on this question. Yeah, I think we have had, um, here in the U.S., we've had more patients leaning towards systemic therapy instead of surgery just because of the rise in COVID-19 cases. And um, the uh, beauty of video visits um, has helped us manage patients remotely so patients don't have to travel from different states to come to California. So I do a lot of video visits. We make sure that they have all of their blood tests and all their MRIs and follow-ups done. So most of our um, visits are done remotely. So this reduces the chance of exposure to COVID-19 while patients are going through treatment. And uh, in Italy, COVID uh, affected uh, operating uh, theater delays only for uh, three to four weeks. So um, since uh, this uh, surgery planning, uh, it's uh, usually long term, six months, uh, it's uh, not an high grade tumor. I think that the decision were uh, similar to prior COVID, but we were able to use, uh, to, to do a better use of uh, the uh, pexidartinib and the patient on trial were uh, receiving uh, pexidardinib at home instead of coming to clinic uh, uh, due to uh, ship shipment policy changes over time. So I think uh, that uh, was really meaningful to for some uh, area like uh, I islands or southern Italy. So uh, thank you, uh, Kristen and Emanuela. And now we'll move on to some uh, cases. So. Um, over to you, Emanuela, and um, uh, look forward to the discussion regarding uh, case management. So, I, um, as I, as we discussed, uh, the age uh, of presentation is uh, about thirty-four. This is uh, one of my patients, uh, and uh, she uh, presented to our clinic with the fifth recurrence and. Uh, she was really uh, in uh, pain, eight out of 10 um, bus uh, scar and uh, stiffness limited her in a daily, uh, daily activity. And uh, as you can see, this disease uh, is uh, also um, taken up on a PET scan and uh, we consider uh, for um, systemic treatment uh, on uh, pexidartinib. So, she underwent um, in, into the trial, but unfortunately into the placebo arm with uh, no crossover. So um, after the trial was closed, she was uh, offered a si sixth uh, uh, surgery. And uh, the next, uh, um, so uh, this, uh, this case uh, uh, underscore our quality of life. Uh, it's a, uh, an important um, uh, side uh, effect of uh, this uh, disease, uh, which have a uh, major consequence in uh, the ability to perform daily activity. And actually we um, address uh, this question into a European registry and uh, also uh, professional and uh, ability is very uh, decreased in this, uh, in this patient. Thanks, Emanuela. And, um... I suppose that leads nicely into a, a discussion regarding um, managing toxicity in um, patients, younger patients in particular with um, uh, TGCT and um, recognizing and managing toxicity with uh, pexidartinib. Um, and this slide um, basically um, illustrates um, 
the uh, recommended approaches to recognizing and managing um, hepatic toxicity um, with this um, uh, agent. So in terms of uh, amino transferase um, uh, elevations, um, in the absence of significant alkaline phosphatase or bilirubin elevation, um, um, these are quite frequent and dose dependent and are generally um, low grade. But the, the second involves a, a mixed or um, cholestatic um, hepatotoxicity, and this involves an increase in um, alkaline uh, phosphatase uh, with or without an increase in amino transferase as well. And this is uncommon and um, idiosyncratic and really um, important to um, um, identify as it can be, rarely be serious, um, um, uh, but it can be um, um, uh, life-threatening. And in terms of managing um, lower grade events, um, frequent monitoring as with many um, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors is important, particularly for elevations in bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase and amino transferases. And um, it's important to monitor during the first eight weeks of treatment um, as illustrated uh, from the enlivened phase three trial. Um, and um, Dose reductions can be used to ameliorate lower grade uh, hepatic events. For the um, uh, 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 REMS program for uh, pexidartinib, it ensures that prescribers are educated on uh, the current indications for the um, um, uh, drug, as well as the risk of liver toxicity and need for liver monitoring at baseline and periodically during treatment. And it's also clearly very important to counsel patients about this risk. Um, and it's, uh, as highlighted in the box at the bottom of um, uh, this slide, it's important to consult the literature for other interventions, um, i.e. additional monitoring, treatment discontinuation for more um, severe um, events. So moving on to the next case, Emanuela. Yes, she, yes she, this case, it's uh, um, on a 76-year-old female. She is a farmer, so she does not uh, complain um, too much, and she doesn't refer to her doctor frequently. She had the, uh, the first uh, arthroscopic synoviectomy back in 2000. Uh, 16, and then uh, oh, she came back uh, um, in uh, 2019 in July with this huge posterior relapse, uh, and uh, she complained on the um, stiffness, but she was still able to work. In Europe, we didn't have uh, Pexidartinib assessed last year, so we asked for a compassionate program, and uh, only in July she was um, able to um a compassionate, a compassionate uh, access to the drug and uh, the um, uh, we decided to start for with 400 milligrams to due to potential toxicity in an older patient and uh, after initial increase of uh, uh, pain and and uh, swelling she referred the, the first 48 hour like spikes inside the the, the knee, uh, she, she started to um, feel better. And now after two months, uh, the, um, she's um, uh, really improved symptomatic and she's managing uh, with uh, toxicity. One, one more thing I want to add in monitoring, including uh, we, we can also monitor uh, creatine phosphokinase, which uh, my um, be an early sign of toxicity and uh, uh, discontinue those uh, when uh, we observe that. Do you think um, there's a role for um, radiation um, given this presentation and age? Um, I often get asked about the role of uh, radiation in, in this disease. So it'll be good to get your, your thoughts, uh, Kristen and uh, Emanuela on, on the use of radiation. Yeah, usually uh, radiation is more effective when patients have minimal residual disease, microscopic disease. So we offer radiation to older patients who have had um, surgery and um, they have microscopic cells. And um, it's 
effective in those patients. In younger patients, we try not to use radiation just due to side effects and toxicities for long term. Yes, uh, same. Uh, due to the biologies of this disease, uh, we consider radiation therapy uh, potential long-term effect uh, to risk uh, for this uh, indication. And uh, so it's uh, really not uh, a frequent option uh, um, uh, at my institute. And are there any other um, options that you would um, consider in, in, in this particular case? The other options um, would be um, other clinical trials that are looking at CSF1, but we do have an you know, approved agent. So I don't think um, anything else other than pexidartinib uh, would make sense. Unless they have toxicity to pexidartinib, then you can use the matnib uh, for these patients. Absolutely. And uh, Emanuela, were there any other options while you were... Uh, yeah. uh... In Italy, in Europe, we don't have uh, Pexidartinib approved yet. So, uh, And the compassionate program ended in, at the end of July. So uh, the, the option in Europe might be Imatini of uh, label, which uh, might cons be considered. Okay, good. Well, m moving on to the uh, third case, Emanuela. This is a 41 uh, bartender and uh, is um, a disease uh, um, uh, was diagnosed in 2018. He underwent uh, an anterior open synovectomy and, uh, and then uh, in June 2019, a posterior open synovectomy. This uh, is the usual uh, approach in two times in uh, in a large number of patients. And then uh, with a relapse free rate of only three uh, months, he relapsed recurrence in September. Um, limited range of motion was um, uh, making his, uh, his uh, daily activity and uh, especially his work at the bar very, very difficult. So in these cases also we um, consider um, a compassion program with pexidartinib due to the very short uh, relapse from uh, open surgery. And in terms of um, uh, the fact that this patient has relapsed after initial surgical interventions and has substantial uh, functional um, limitations, what do you two think about the role of further surgery or radiation in, in this case, given the context of our previous discussion, um, particularly regarding the use of radiation? Maybe I can start with Kristen. Yeah, for some younger patients who um, can have further surgery, I have been giving pre-operative um, or neoadjuvant treatment with pexidartinib. Um, I usually do to maximum, give it to maximum benefit according to the MRI response. And then um, further surgery then may become uh, possible after that. And then sometimes um, you can do radiation just, uh, you know, for microscopic cells. But again, this patient is uh, younger, so we have to be very cautious with radiation therapy. What are your thoughts about um, uh, this preoperative systemic therapy um, approach, Emanuela? Uh, I think that uh, there are no data, but uh, I, the, in the um, routine use, uh, I think uh, that uh, in the future my, uh, we, we can have a good experience and uh, uh, my, my become uh, one uh, strategy of, uh, of treatment. And in terms of um, radiation for this particular patient, um, did, did that? Did, did you discuss that with him, or um, again following no, on? Again, in uh, we all, all discuss all these patients on a multidisciplinary board, but uh, in um, our experience, uh, uh, radiation uh, would be uh, too risk uh, high risk for um, low uh, local aggressive tumor. Agreed. Agreed. Have you um, experience of any uh, of using imatinib, for instance, as uh, preoptive systemic therapy in in TGCT? 
no, no, not yet. We, I, I just have experience with the drag discontinuation, maybe an option. So just to to see how long is uh, the progression-free inter interval of, uh, of after uh, uh, treatment with uh, imatinib. And uh, I, I think that some patient might also benefit of that uh, approach, especially older patient. How about you, uh, Kristen? Yeah, I've used, um, in terms of discontinuation therapy, I've used uh, pexidartinib in patients who have had a great response after six to 12 months, and they're young and they want to stop taking it. So uh, we stop for um, six months, do another MRI, or watch them uh, symptomatically. And if they do have recurrence of symptoms, then we start the pexidartinib again. But I have been able to keep them off of the drug for a year at a time for some of these patients. So and they appreciate that. Yeah, agreed. Um, that very, very good points. So um, in the interest of time, we should move on to the uh, fourth and final um, case. So again, over to you, Emanuela. The last case is um, a 63-year-old man, and uh, the, the, he has a very long history uh, dating back 1987. He underwent an open synovectomy for a um, huge uh, TGCT of the knee. And then uh, again, uh, syn open synovectomy in 1990 and uh, 1996, then in 2012, with uh, so more than uh, 14 years, uh, in, the disease relapsed, and this time MRI showed local recurrence and also um, lymph lympho no nodal metastasis. He uh, was um, in a big pain, vascore eight, and was unable to work. We, he underwent. Uh, uh, an amputation due to the um, uh, huge relapse and the, also the, the uh, in, in, impossibility to rescue his uh, joints, especially the bone was totally compromised. And uh, the, there was a need of uh, lim, lymphadenectomy. We, we're happy to observe that um, the histology of this tumor was uh, still low grade. As you can see, there were mononuclear cells, synovial like, and giant cells uh, with these um, uh, multinucleated uh, gigantic cell, but no cytologic uh, atypia. Again, underscoring the uh, something very typical of, of a TGCT. There are some malignancies, but very, very low uh, risk of, uh, of uh, metastatic spread. So this case um, really does illustrate the challenges of this um, disease and um, really highlights that um, the, the issues with uh, multiple relapse. And I suppose the major question here is what's next after four relapses for this patient with a limited range of um, motion? And clearly um, this patient was um, suffering from a very aggressive form of uh, TGCT. Um, and his experiences really illustrate the challenging nature of this uh, disease with multiple relapses. Uh, leading to limited range of motion and ultimately um, amputation. Um, and it's uh, important to note that there are also lymph node metastases uh, necessitating lymphadenopathy. Um, so I suppose that, you know, the major question here for you both is if this patient had been diagnosed in the present day um, and his uh, TGCT had shown a similar course, would his treatment have been um, different? Maybe I'll, I'll start with Emanuela for, for this question. I think that uh, when uh, the indication is an amputation, always uh, both uh, uh, surgeon and uh, medical oncologist as, uh, at the multidisciplinary tumor board would um, assess the possibility of a tyrosine kinase inhibitor used as a neoadjuvant. But um, some of the cases, uh, as I said, uh, the 
very compromised uh, uh, bone joints and surrounding tissue because uh, unfortunately in these uh, tumors not only the disease is affecting the joint but also the repetitive uh, surgeries that compromise uh, yes. the joints. Yeah, I do agree with Emanuela. I think if it was uh, just present day uh, with systemic therapy, he may have had, um, you know, good response and we may have been uh, able to prevent um, amputation. But uh, it seems that he did have a very aggressive disease with lymph node metastasis. But again, it highlights the importance of multidisciplinary care for these um, yeah. patients. And I, I've been referred a, a, a number of um, patients with TGCT that have been given um, amputation as the um, only um, treatment options. So, you know, things have clearly um, changed and it's important to, um, to manage, manage these patients within an experienced multidisciplinary team. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Emanuela, for those excellent um, case illustrations. And uh, we'll move on to some more uh, questions now. And the first is, how can the general orthopedic surgeon in the community best expedite um, the, tra the transfer of care of a patient with TGCT to a multidisciplinary oncology team for treatment? So maybe I'll start with Kristen for this one. Yeah, I think the most important first step is for them uh, to tr to refer to an orthopedic tumor surgeon because um, the orthopedic tumor surgeons are usually at tertiary care centers that have sarcoma groups, and um, and they the, the regular general orthopedic surgeons usually know the tumor surgeons in the community and at the uh, university setting. So then the orthopedic tumor surgeon will bring the case into our tumor board, multidisciplinary tumor board, and the, the discussion there that can lead to a plan for the patient's um, care. Fantastic. And Emanuela, your thoughts on, on this question? And uh, I thank you, Robin, for this question, because I think it's uh, some that uh, it's uh, really changing nowadays, the patient journey. We perform a, 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 a research, and uh, uh, in the past, all patients underwent to rheumatologist, general doctor, and uh, physiotherapist. Now, due to the uh, expanding knowledge of the possibility of systemic treatment, and also advocacy groups, and also uh, social network uh, groups, uh, uh, most of the patients also refer uh, direct to the uh, medical oncologist in sarcoma unit. So I, I usually routinely see uh, patients that ask for treatment before even seeing a surgeon, but that's good because I can discuss with my surgeon in the next uh, uh, week um, tumor board and uh, we decide uh, for the, the right choice. So I think that uh, things have um, really changed and speeding up for them and it's really um, fundamental for the outcome um, uh, final outcome of this uh, treatment, uh, tumor treatment. Great, thank thank you both. Um, I think we're um, we're up to time now. So with that, I'd like to uh, remind everybody to um, uh, please remember to complete and submit your post test and evaluation for credit. And once again, you can visit us at peerview.com forward slash TGCT20, where you can apply for credit and download the slides and practice aids. Um, and you can also watch for the on-demand version of this event. So thank you again, everybody, and have, have a really good day.